Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Dr. Donald Pelto and I have three guests today on the show. Uh, I have Dr. Robert Spaulding and he is the developer of Medi Nails. I also have two of his students that are uh, nail salon technicians but with advanced degrees and one is uh, Lori Ducharme and the other one is Nina Don Patton. And I'm glad to have all of you here on the show this, this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, I appreciate being here. Thank you. And uh, we're doing this via Skype today because both of them are a little bit further away. And uh, uh, Dr. Spaulding, he has written a book and it has a very intriguing title. And the name of this book is Death by Pedicure, The Dirty Secrets of Nail Salons. And so for all those that are watching the show, I, I want you to just to kind of tell them a little bit about your book. And that's kind of a, a, a dangerous title. So tell me a little bit how you came about writing this book. Well, that is kind of interesting. People think it's a mystery novel. And um, then we changed it again to the science of pedicures because we had a hard time selling death by pedicure to the cosmetology industry. So we have it in two different versions. Since, since I'm self-published, we can, we can play around with the titles. And uh, we will have a third edition out that will also be called Death by Pedicure. But um, I got interested in podiatry. Um, 20 years ago. I've been in practice now for 20 years, this past July, and um, <clears throat> I grew up in a family of psychiatrists, so I decided my dad just retired uh, at 87 a couple months ago, and he's still seeing patients he saw 50 years ago. They never got any better. They just kept hanging <laughs> on to him, and so um, I decided I liked the instantaneous gratification of podiatry, you get uh, most people walk out of your office the same day they came in with less pain. So that's always a satisfaction. Um, I am a little bit unusual in that I'm an older podiatrist. <clears throat> I got started actually in law enforcement and uh, did that for a number of years. I worked third shift and then I went to um, uh, paramedic school during the day. And uh -huh. when I got out of two years after paramedic school, I started working as a paramedic at the Memphis Fire Department. And I did that for uh, 10 years until I got injured in a rescue. And then I went back and updated my pre-med. And so I got into podiatry. I, I, there was a doctor, a rally in um, uh, Memphis that uh, I enjoyed seeing what he did and how he got people in and out of there so fast. But um, it, it, in that, 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 I am different in the sense that I was an older student when I came in. I had a lot of background in other areas. And so that actually helped me eventually get into um, some other aspects of podiatry that I probably would not have done had I not had that background. Yeah, so, so right now you're, you're still in, in, in private practice and based on if you're gonna go as long as your family member, you'll be for another 40 or 50 years, right? Uh, on, on table, yes, uh, on the table. I don't know if that'll happen. <laughs> and, and then what's kind of interesting about you, which I don't know really anyone else, but I don't know if it's on the side or in conjunction with your practice, you, you developed this other, is it, is it a business or is it an institution? It's called MediNails. Yeah, thanks. Um, sometimes I have to go back and think of how I got there, but um, even in, when I was in clinical, just doing my, as a student in podiatry, uh, I was really focused on when people started coming in with these ingrown nails and problems from nail salons. I kept taking that in the history. And the other thing that intrigued me going through my um, clinical practice and, and as a student in podiatry with some of the interesting products that we use that was different than uh, I had ever seen before. You know, yeah. things that had urea and things that had some other antifungal aspects to it. So I knew that when I got out of uh, medical school that I would eventually start looking to do that. So as I started doing more and more routine foot care, which is what I wanted to focus on, uh, I started seeing that cross um, dimensions between the two uh, nail salons and they were trimming nails and we were trimming nails it's just that we were doing it at a higher level and so that's where I got my initial interest but to go on to many nails after being in practice a number of years and seeing what we could try and prevent as podiatrists uh, I started having lectures that I was giving to several of the cosmetology um, uh, seminars because we had come up, uh, another podiatrist and I had come up with a product called Just for Toenails, which was a, an enhanced nail polish. And we kind of started that trend back in 98. And as a result of that connection with uh, uh, cosmetology as well as the, uh, the, the, the nail polish, uh, I started making friends in the industry. And Athan Elliott was one of the first ones that I had met. She is now my VP of Many Nails. 
and all the girls know her and she's been involved in this for a long, long time too. And we focused in on what would be commonalities to stop some of the infections. And the first things that we came up with was an autoclave. Yeah. Good. So I'm going to go off uh, asking you, uh, Dr. Spaulding, and I'm going to ask some of your students, okay, that uh, both Lori and Nina Dawn are, are graduates of your course, and they are, they were, they are uh, licensed pedicure and manicurists. And so tell me kind of what inspired you to, to get advanced training and your interest in, in Medi Nails and your interest even in the profession. My interest came from meeting Dr. Spaulding at one of these um, hair shows that I attended and caught my interest and um, saw the, the correlation, the need in our industry um, with the amount of clients coming in with health problems or the lack of um, sanitation, sterilization issues uh, in our industry. And the program is laid out as such. It, it just took us to a higher level of education and practice in our salon. Yeah. And I more affiliated with the medical field um, to have that connection with them because it made sense. Good. And how about you, Nina Don? Anything to add? Well, I saw a, note, a need in our salon with our older clients and our clients who were diabetics. We li I lived in an area that had a lot of hospital-centric location and we had a lot of clients coming in that were undergoing chemo treatments. So they had a higher level of care that was needed because yeah. they were compromised and we wanted to make sure that we were not just giving them beautiful polish but healthy nails and a healthy service and the only way to do that is to continually get that education and I met Dr. Spaulding I'd, I'd known about his program so I did the Medi Nail Learning Center program and it literally changed everything that I did in the salon we were already doing a good job but now we knew better, and I brought that back to the salon. We upgraded our sanitation. We purchased the autoclave, and we marketed that. And in addition to that, we started educating our clients on why. Why did we need to know their health histories? Why did we prefer to sterilize with autoclaves rather than just disinfect like everyone else? Mm -hmm. It was a really great opportunity to help commu communicate those issues with our clients, educate the community, and elevate our entire industry. One salon, one nail tech, one we're out of time. We're out of time. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and Dr. Spaulding, how long has this work been going on? Has it been an arduous task? Has it been a number of years you've been working on this? Or, you know? Ever since 99, when I met Athena and started going to these trade shows and people would talk to me about the rash of infections, what they could do to prevent it, uh, unfortunately, the cosmetology uh, boards are not necessarily the best answers for that because they've been kind of wrote, um, handed down uh, techniques that haven't worked for a number of years, so we had to sort of break the mold. And so when I f found out through uh, just experience as a podiatrist, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing as a podiatrist, the, the rash of uh, nail fungus and the infections that would come out of nail salons coming to your practice, uh, I started trying to dissect what is going to make the biggest difference. And when we came down to three things, and that was autoclaves, um, aseptic care, and referrals. And so those three things, if they just would do that, would decrease a great number of the um, uh, infections that come out of there. And, and of course, uh, a lot of that has to do with the liquid disinfectant agents that are just not effective. So let's, let's be really practical for those that are, are viewing this show. If, if they, I'm sure a majority or a lot of the, the men, and probably few men, but uh, most of the women, or a lot of the women, they go to the nail salon, summertime. What should they be looking for in a reputable nail salon? I guess I'll, I'll offer this to, to, to Lori and Nina Don. What should they be looking for? Um, first of all, initial uh, appearance of the salon. When you walk in, cleanliness overall cleanliness, um, surface cleanliness. Don't be afraid to ask what their method of, of sanitation is. Do okay. they use an autoclave? The word is definitely out there now. More and more salons are um, seeing the need to elevate their sanitation practices. Um, single use files, buffers, toe separators, um, verifiability for these sanitation practices, um, record keeping, 
and referrals. Like I'm not afraid to recognize something going on with my client and send them to the doctor, you know, that this is not something that we should be practicing in a salon or we see things, people come to us. They come to see you, but they want to come get their feet made free and have nail polish put on, but there's that fine gray area. So I want to make sure I'm educating the consumer that they should seek professional help when necessary. Yeah. Uh, As, go ahead. And, go ahead. And I actually work with the local hospital area in my area, and I have a class for the consumers where I teach the very basics of how to <coughs> use the salon to receive those services. And some of the basics, as Lori mentioned, is it clean? Do they? And some of the things I specifically say is look for that health department or board of cosmetology rating. They're the licensing. They should be inspected at least once a year in most states. Look for a business license. Look for the individual's licensing. Every individual in that building should be licensed. Every state except one requires us to be licensed in order to work. Look for their licensing. Some states require wearing a name tag, like Tennessee. Do they have a name tag? Does it match the license on the wall? These are some really basic things that they should be able to do. But the biggest thing, beyond looking for that, you sit in a clean salon, can you communicate with your nail technician? Can you ask them questions without them being offended? Like Lori said, ask, what is your sanitation protocol? If they're not proud of their sanitation protocol, you need to leave and go find somewhere that is proud of their sanitation. Don't bring your own implements to us. We have our professional implements that we use. If you feel the need to bring your own supply, you're going to the wrong place. Yeah. You need to trust them. You need to be able to communicate with them and share your expectations. It's not just about how you how your polish looks when you leave. It's about how you feel. It's about the health. It's about if I see something, as Lori said, we are trained to recognize and to refer. And we need to be able to communicate that with you and with your physician. Yeah, good. These are very important things for consumers to look out for when they're finding their salons. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Spaulding, anything else to, to add to that? Well, they hit on the most practical things that an individual can come in and do. But one of the things that they can also be aware of is when someone says, let me help you with that ingrown nail or let me help you with that fungal nail, that's clearly out of their scope of practice. And some of these people do this uh, uh, with such a, a trivial attitude to what the potential infection rates are is that these are things that they just don't perform in salons and they do it on, on quite ubiquitously every day. And so those are the kind of habits and scope of practice changes that we hope to impart with our training. However, uh, when people come in, they're seeking that kind of services because they don't want to uh, go and pay the rates that, that podiatrists or they don't have health insurance and they think the nail salon can get them out of trouble. Uh, they may get away with that a few times, but eventually it catches up with them. Yeah, yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about this referral relationship between, um, you know, Lori and Nina Dawn and, and a podiatrist like Dr. Spaulding. Uh, is it something that the, the doctor has to seek you out? Do you seek out doctors that you currently refer to? How does that go, starting with the, with the nail technicians? I think it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went through the Medi Nail Learning Center program, you are required to do a 40-hour internship with a podiatrist. The first podiatry office that I approached actually was already familiar with the program and they had been searching for someone that had been going through the program to add to their office. To refer to. On, mm -hmm. on that, well, I actually ended up working in their office for two years as a medical nail technician. So they were actively searching. They were already familiar with the process. But on the flip side, we are still educating the doctors and the physicians to understand that we are not just nail techs, right. that we do have this higher education. We are trained to recognize. We do want that relationship of referral. So on the nail tech side, we need to talk with our clients. Our clients may already have physicians. We can say, you know, go speak to your doctor, give him my information, and let him know that we need to develop this for your benefit. And that starts breaking down those walls because there's a lot of physicians that just don't understand mm -hmm. that we are highly trained and highly educated 
well beyond polish. Yeah, good, good. And, and how about in urine, Dr. Spaulding? Well, first of all, you have two of my top um, graduates. And so they're, they're, they're one of the few people that have gone beyond just um, taking the training and working as a standard. They both have gone on to excel in other areas that have promoted a lot of this uh, new approach to um, uh, protecting the client. And so I'm glad you picked these two out of the thousand that we have. And um, to, to get back into why they're exceptional is that they have taken these aspects and gone on and worked in areas for like Lori, who's gone on and uh, started working with the public health departments to get better standards of care, whereas the cosmetology boards had failed to do it in her area. And uh, Nita Dawn has gone on to develop a business associated with providing these safety items to nail tech. So I'm very proud of what they take the basic training and expand it on it. That's great. So if you both want to share a little bit about those experiences that Dr. Spaulding referred to. Um, I approached my public health department um, following in step with Boston Public Health, who uh, overtook, so to say, uh, the nail salon in the city of Boston as far as safety goes and inspecting. And their regulations and guidelines that they put in place are much higher than what the state for cosmetology requirements are. In, uh, in such where they require autoclave usage to be brought up to code to the International Mechanical Code for ventilation. Uh, they enforce the single use items. They have an outreach team that goes uh, into these salons to help the employers and employees uh, understand these regulations and guidelines and how to practice safer, which in turn has a safer environment for the consumer to go to. So I advocated to my local public health department and went armed with information and they uh, took it into vote and it now got implemented um, a year or so ago in my town. And I think I'm moving forward with trying to connect with other health departments um, and get also the word out to nail techs like we can make a difference, like one person can make a difference. It just takes a little bit of initiative um, to make that connection local health departments, but it's needed because on a state level, there are minimal amount of state inspectors to oversee thousands of salons. So there's no way that um, they can, we can be watched over closely enough to really protect the public health. Unless you watch yourself. Yeah, we need, we're self-regulated. Well, yeah, yeah, we, we are self-regulated in a lot of ways. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, uh, Anita, Don, a little bit about your, your, what you've gone on and done. Because of the education I received through Medi Nail Learning Center, the education is out there for the male professionals, for the beauty professionals. What I realized though, that there was a gap between getting that education and getting the products that we needed and the support for the higher levels of disinfectant and sanitation. The autoclave specifically was an issue. The only place really to purchase these autoclaves were from medical sites, medical companies. When, as a nail technician, I would call the medical companies and they would say, which doctor's office are you with? And I would explain that I was getting it for my son. Literally, you could hear my And that was an issue. We have this amazing education. Now we need to get Yeah, okay. That support so to put these things together specifically for the beauty industry and to have that support for the beauty industry. And don't get me wrong, there's some beauty companies that offer these items as well. But their mainstay is the polishes, or is the lotions and, products. and the shampoos. And that's wonderful. The only thing that I do is safety and sanitation, personal protection equipment, gloves, the proper N95 rated masks. And of course, I also go out to the consumers and help them. It's a three-legged approach that we need to elevate this industry. We have the doctors, we have the nail professionals, and we have the consumers. All three of these guys need to be supported and on board for this tool to stand. And that's what the three of us are trying so much to do for our industry, for yeah. the better part of the health of our communities. Let, let's just take a, a little bit of, of time. I know for all of you, you're all passionate about this word sterilization. 
okay? And, and so I'd like Dr. Spaulding to talk a little bit about sterilization. How, how does this differ? I know we talked a little bit beforehand about podiatry, but how, how does the sterilization, let's say if you're in an in a, 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 a advanced podiatry practice that already is using an autoclave, it, what, are, what are some other nail techs? What percentage are using autoclaves? Why aren't they using them? Is it only the price or are there other reasons? Good question. The, um, I'm going to back up to answer that a little bit more. One of the things that uh, you as a practicing podiatrist and I as a practicing podiatrist get asked by our female patients is, where is a safe place to go get a pedicure? And the historic answer is, you don't go get a pedicure, you're going to get a nail fungus. Well, the lady will walk out of your office and go get a pedicure because she didn't get an answer, so she's going to answer it for herself and try to weed through it. So to give her a better answer, I had to give her some reasons why you seek out those nail salons that are practicing at a higher level than what the state mandates. And that's the problem, is the state uh, only allows for basic disinfection with products that actually don't get out and do the job that they claim to. Um, there's a, a long litany of information about the EPA and the failure of their registration of products. So the only way to be absolutely sure in my mind, and as I went forward to looking at all these infections, is to get something that absolutely kills everything on the instrument. And when, when you're dealing with a, a mindset that thinks that all you need to do is kill some of the basic organisms, but not all the organisms, and that's what the premise is on most of the cosmetology boards is, is that we're not in a, um, th they love to stand on their podium and say, hey, we're not in the health fields. We don't have to, to, to work at the level that a doctor does. But the, the flip side of that is, is they're working out of their scope of practice 50% of the time, and they are working in the health field whether they know it or not. And if you're going to do that, then you need to have the highest level of protection, and that is autoclave sterilization, where you take a pressure cooker, basically, and you cook everything that's out there as far as a microbe, and that will make sure that instrument is fully um, sterilized, that it will not have an organism that could hurt somebody. And if you reduce some of the uh, uh, types of services that cause wound uh, potential for breaking the skin, even something as simple as a nail file can do that, but if you're in there aggressively trying to, to work on ingrown nails out of your scope of practice, you definitely don't need mm -hmm. to be using dirty instruments. And so the, 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 what we say in, in many nails is, is that uh, we, we practice at a higher standard, that um, uh, we practice above the state standards. Not, we don't try to meet the state standards. We try to exceed the state standards. And that, that is the mantra that we go forward with. And if you do that, then you're going to have less infections. Perfect, perfect. And what do you see uh, f as the future for, for Medi-Nails? And what do you see for the future for, for nail technicians? Well, one of the other questions, which I don't know if I answered in the full scope, is the referral relationship. Yeah. Right now, there is no... There's really nothing taught at the uh, cosmetology level to teach you how to work with a physician to refer out. They say refer, but they don't tell you how to do it. So we had to come up with the same mechanism that you and I would use to refer to another specialist and, and then in hopes that they would refer back because as, more, as you send more and more of those referrals to a particular uh, uh, physician, they take notice about this person is not working out of their scope of practice. They are trying to uh, do the right thing and send those problem patients. And then when I am asked, where's a safe place to go get a pedicure, I know that this person is practic practicing at a higher standard, and I will refer back to them for the pedicure. So I hope to see in the future more and more referral relationships occur. And with that comes the training, and with that comes focus on scope of practice, and with that also comes the, the use of autoclave. So in the future, I hope that more nail techs, through their basic training, will learn how to refer, and then they will be able to receive referrals from physicians on a much easier basis. Perfect, perfect. Well, that's great. What you've done for the profession is just wonderful for their, for their profession and helping them out. Anything else that you want is, was, were, to, to mention that would be beneficial to the audience? Well. Again, I go back and I harp on how the even the most basic disinfectants are not working according to the CDC. You know, you have 
competing government agencies, FDA, CDC, EPA, and they all have their little turf. And the CDC has come out with a wonderful set of guidelines that the APMA adopted years ago and that I'm hoping eventually all cosmetology boards will adopt, not the EPA rules and regs, but the CDCs. And the CDC shows how ineffective these EPA liquid disinfectants are and hopefully better information sharing between these um, agencies and people who are practicing at the forefront of the industry like Laurie and uh, Nita Dawn and all the other graduates we have are trying to educate other nail techs that they need this advanced education and hopefully this will be available as it has always been and I have found that online training is so much more accessible than someone who has to travel, book a hotel, sit through a long lecture when they could do that technically in their pajamas at home when when they have the time to do it. Yeah, Dr. Spaulding, if, if anyone here is, is watching and, and they might be a nail technician and they're interested in, in Medi Nails, um, tell us a little bit about the course. How long does it take? We can't really talk about values, but just in terms of how long does it take? Is it, is it online? What are the requirements? Again, you're correct. It is an online training. And for the ANT, it's very simplistic. ANTs don't require an internship. What are ANTs? I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I apologize. Um, we have several programs. One is called the Advanced Nail Technicians Program. The other one is called the Medical Nail Technicians Program. And then we have another one called the Podiatric Medical Assistance Program. So for the basic nail tech who wants to practice safe in their salon, the Advanced Nail Tech uh, training is a 15 module, takes about two hours per module. So it's about a 30 hour course that they could complete. Some have completed it in a single weekend if they've taken both days to, to um, take the course, but that doesn't require an internship. It's just a lot of good information. And once they implement that, they're gonna be practicing at a much higher level than they were graduated with their state license. Wonderful, wonderful. And that's, that's available to anyone. That's available. Anyone can take it. Now, whether you, uh, uh, we, we call them uh, advanced nail te technicians, and we also, for people who are just wanting to get the basics, there's, you know, we have medical assistants who just want to get lower extremity information about uh, trimming nails for, for, on behalf of other uh, uh, medical professionals yeah. like podiatrists. And so, they can take the basics and move up to the medical nail tech course after they completed the advanced nail tech. And some of them who, who are really just wanting to, uh, just anyone off the street technically can take a, um, an assistance course. However, they may not get licensed unless they're working. They can't practice individual as an individual independent practitioner, but they can work under a medical professional like a podiatrist. Uh -huh. uh, under the podiatrist license, under their direct directions. Perfect. And uh, and so, Lori and, and Nina Dawn, anything else that you want to say in conclusion, uh, kind of about the the future of nail technicians, in your opinion? I see a great relationship um, starting to form between many nail technicians and the medical profession, um, including one between you and I. Uh, you are definitely my number one referring doc right now, and I want to continue to build on that relationship. And I think there is um, a need for um, more medical nail techs, maybe with a presence in more podiatry practices, doing safe cosmetic services within a medical setting where you do your job over there, but send them over to us, you know, just make them pretty in mm -hmm. a safe environment. So that's sort of um, what I hope to see happen in the future with more nail techs getting on board and getting better relationships with dermatologists and, and podiatrists. Perfect. And how about you, Nina Don? With 85% of our population in North America currently being diagnosed with diabetes, in the next 20 years, the majority of our population is going to be in the elderly geriatric range. We definitely need to start bridging this gap that we have between the medical industry and the cosmetic industry when it comes to nail care and foot care, foot health. It's so imperative that we start working together and bridging that, not just between the nail professionals mm -hmm. and the medical professionals, but with the consumers so that they understand, again, where to go for those safe services, that it's not just about the policy. We hold your life in our hands, and we need to be sure that we take that responsibility mm -hmm. seriously and that the doctors know that, the consumers know that, 
we know that it's all going to come together and we definitely see a movement in our industry that there are the professionals that are deciding not to move in this direction and there's a large group of us that are moving in this direction and i think our flow is going to take this to that next level great great well lori and uh, nina don and dr spaulding appreciate your time and for joining me on this healthy living episode Hey guys, thank you for watching Healthy Living. You're going to find a few links here I'd like you to click. One is to subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Uh, also, you can learn more. There are some videos here you can see.